massive ethnic cleansing in Kosovo after the end of the Cold War, coupled with the Rwandan genocide in 1994, finally convinced the international community that never again should the world sit by whilst governments committed mass atrocity crimes against their own populations. The consequence of these watershed events was the publication in 2001 of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty Report. The report redefined state sovereignty to include responsibility and critically served as a tacit reminder to governments that they could no longer hide behind the protection offered them by the principle of non-interference in their domestic affairs. This was particularly relevant to instances when governments could not or would not protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity or ethnic cleansing. The report further argued that the international community has a responsibility to prevent and to react to such atrocities and also to rebuild these societies subsequent to intervention. Finally, the report also proposed precautionary principles to mitigate against the possible misuse of force in military interventions. The findings of the 2001 report were unanimously adopted by world leaders at the United Nations World Summit in 2005. So as it stands today, it would appear that the responsibility to protect principle rests on three pillars. Firstly, the primary responsibility continues to rest with individual states to protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity, and from their incitement. Secondly, the international community has a residual responsibility to assist individual states to fulfill this responsibility. And thirdly, the international community commits to taking timely and decisive action through diplomatic, humanitarian, and other peaceful measures through Chapter 6 and 8 of the UN Charter. It is only when peaceful means prove to be inadequate and when member states are manifestly failing to protect their populations that the international community can invoke Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, which allows for the implementation of enforcement measures. So unique amongst many regional organizations is the African Union, which has woven the responsibility to protect principle into its very constitutive fabric. Article 4 of the African Union's Constitutive Act grants it the right and responsibility to protect. Whereas Article 4, however, still refers to non-interference in the affairs of member states, coupled with the right of the latter to self-defense, Article 4H, in particular, affirms the right of the Union to collectively intervene in a member state, pursuant to a decision of the Assembly in respect of grave circumstances, which includes war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. So this would seem to indicate that the African Union has made a cognitive shift from regime to human security. It now prioritizes the principle of non-indifference over that of non-interference. And it is ostensibly committed to offering indigenous African solutions to the continent's inter- and intrastate conflicts. This approach is further enhanced by the continued development of an elab elaborate African peace and security architecture, which includes a peace and security council, an early warning system, a proposed African standby force, a panel of the wise to mediate in conflicts and sub-regional military brigades. The puzzle, however, remains as to why the African Union consistently fails to take the lead in military interventions on the continent whilst member states are manifestly failing to protect their populations. For those who perceive international relations only through a realist or a rationalist lens, then the pursuit of power by any means and the satisfaction of narrow national interests is the stuff of politics. By extension, therefore, the African Union's relative passivity can be understood by the logic of consequence, cost-benefit considerations, and utility maximization in the pursuit of competing national interests. Therefore, any proposed African, unity, African Union military intervention is constrained by these competing interests, it is limited by the costs associated with the use of force and requires attendant political will and external partners in the intervention so as to ensure burden sharing and legitimacy. Realists might further argue that, the, that despite the important subsidiarity role that the African Union perceives for itself in relation to resolving indigenous conflicts, experience shows that powerful states 
and particularly the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, often retain the power of decision on the issue of intervention, whilst weaker states claim sovereignty as their last line of defense against such interventions. So although some of these arguments are intuitively convincing, they perhaps ignore perspectives emanating from the academic literature, which portrays the responsibility to protect as an emerging norm in the conduct of international relations. This characterization now confirms that norms somehow matter in determining how states behave, and also speaks to how constructivism generally has begun to shape theoretical discourse in the study of international relations. Whereas realists characteristically reject norms as rationalizations for self-interest and deny them explanatory power, constructivists are now beginning to demonstrate that their more sociological approach leads to new and meaningful interpretations of international politics. By defining norms as collective expectations about proper behavior for a given identity, constructivists can now argue that the logic of appropriateness is just as plausible a predictor of human and state behavior as the rationalist's logic of consequence. Perceived through this ontological lens then, the African Union's inconsistency in intervening where member states are manifestly failing to their, protect their populations might have something to do with the way in which the norm has been institutionally localized. The latitude for interpretation inherent in the responsibility to protect norm particularly when it comes to the question of who should intervene and who can use force when, can be attributed to the fact that unlike the broader principle of humanitarian intervention, the former is not codified in the broader corpus of international law. Because the responsibility to protect is an evolving norm, it is difficult to enforce compliance with its injunctions or to punish deviance. Therefore, if we do accept that norms are collective expectations about proper behavior for a given identity, then we must also accept that in the absence of legal resource, the crucial test of a norm's existence is not that members of a community never violate it. Rather, a norm's strength is measured by the level of opprobrium community members attract from their peers for engaging in behavior that violates the norm. What is under-theorized in the literature is the extent to which norms travel how they compete for prominence in a thick normative milieu, and how they are contested before they can claim validity. Within constructivism, the world polity or universalistic model would argue that since states are cultural constructs and are embedded in a world society which encourages processes of modernization, learning, imitation, and organ organizational isomorphism, then states comply with norms for reputational enhancement and to align themselves with international standards. Linked to this might be the notion of norm diffusion, which argues that norms evolve in patent life cycles, resulting in a final period of internalization, where they achieve taken-for-granted qualities domestically and internationally. What one might contend, however, that this universalistic interpretation is limited since it assumes that good global norms somehow replace bad local beliefs and practices. Of greater interest is how we can account for how the same norm will have a significant constitutive effect in one state, but fail to do so in others. One explanation might lie in the degree of cultural match between a global norm and domestic practice, and how norm diffusion might be more rapid when a cultural match exists between a systemic norm and a target country and the extent to which it resonates with historically constructed domestic norms. Most convincing, for me at least, however, is Acharya's concept of norm localization. He argues that while constructivist scholarship has generally examined the way in which presumably good global norms have prevailed over preconceived bad local beliefs and practices, little empirical work has been conducted with regard to the extent to which local beliefs are themselves constituted of a legitimate normative order which conditions the acceptance of foreign norms. His dynamic explanation of norm diffusion now describes how local agents reconstruct foreign norms to ensure that those norms fit with the agent's cognitive priors and identities. Hence, the concept of localization focuses rather on how domestic political structures and, ancient, uh, and agents condition normative change. This investigatory framework of norm diffusion, which prioritizes the agency role of norm takers through a dynamic congruence building process, is called localization. Localization is thus 
a complex process and outcome by which norm takers build congruence between transnational norms and local beliefs and practices. In this process, foreign norms, which may not initially cohere with the latter, are incorporated into local norms. The success of norm diffusion strategies depends on the extent to which they provide opportunities for localization. Localization, again, is not necessarily synonymous with adaptation, since in the former, the cognitive prize of norm takers are not extinguished, but are mutually inflected with foreign norms. Therefore, in localization, the existing normative order and the foreign norm are mutually constitutive of each other. But the subsequent, subsequent change in behavior is better understood in relation to the primacy of the local normative order. So the prospects for norm localization are enhanced if norm takers believe that new external norms, such as the responsibility to protect, can assist in improving the legitimacy and authority of existing institutions. Furthermore, if local norms are strong and are derived from ingrained cultural beliefs and practices, then it is likely that foreign norms will be localized as opposed to being accepted wholesale. Additionally, the possibility for norm localization is influenced by the credibility of local actors or what Acharya calls insider proponents. Thus, the credibility of local agents depends on their social context and standing. Local norm entrepreneurs are likely to be more credible if they are seen by their target audience as upholders of local values and identity and not simply agents of outside forces or actors and whether they are part of a local epistemic community that could claim a record of success in prior normative processes. So, in order to conclude then, it stands to reason, it stands to reason therefore, that not all AU member states have localized the R2P norm in the same way. Norms are inherently contested, and the way in which they are empowered at a domestic level varies significantly. The research challenge, therefore, is to account for how the African Union might give greater practical effect to the responsibility to protect norm despite its uneven localization by member states. And so, therefore, it's important to remember that institutions such as the African Union need not only be rationally efficient in terms of their function. Institutions have the ability to transmit cultural practices too. Institutions are products of societal norms and values which are then infused into the institutions. Institutions are custodians of symbolic systems and cognitive scripts which guide the behavior of actors so that behavior is governed by the logic of appropriateness as opposed to the logic of consequence. Sociological new institutionalism, my interest area, also promotes intersubjectivity and cognition so that institutions provide the cognitive scripts whereby the behavior of others can be interpreted. So hence, the challenge for the African Union is to manage the issue of intervention despite the fact that the broader responsibility to protect norm has been localized unevenly by its member states. In my view, by grounding the research in the sociological new institutional approach allows one to study institutions and the extent to which they can promote a collective definition of interest based on feelings of solidarity, community or loyalty. Importantly, having such interest does not mean that member states are now irrational or no longer cal calculate costs and benefits, but they do so on a higher level of social aggregation, diffuse reciprocity, and willingness to bear costs without selective incentives. Mm -hmm.